Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now about a month ago I purchased this aging Acer Predator gaming PC. To my dismay it was mostly broken apart from the graphics card but performance was far from acceptable in 2022. I spent the next few hours trying to get this thing to boot and I even deployed the top secret resuscitation method that all of us budget tech YouTubers use when we've exhausted all the other options clear nothing despite this the case is just too cool to discard so i decided to gut the system entirely and build a better more capable pc inside of it something that didn't cost too much but would be able to handle modern games with respectable frame rates after all this never used proprietary parts so anything should fit and the biggest drawback of building inside this is that we won't have USB 3 at the front. Here's what I chose to replace the original and not very alive components. We've got ourselves an i3-10100F, still one of the best budget CPUs around, 16 gigs of DDR4 which, although is 3200MHz because it was cheaper, runs at 2666 max with this board, the H410M HVS. This is a spare I've had lying around for a while and eventually I want to get an i9 to stick in here to see if it works. The graphics card is the last of the desktop Polaris's, the RX 590. It's like an 8GB 480 and 580 but it's a tiny bit faster and while it's probably not worth spending the extra over a 580 if the price difference is significant where you live, if it costs the same or less then go for it. This is the Power Color Red Devil OC Edition. It looks pretty cool and it runs nice and quietly. All of this is powered by a Thermaltake 500 watt smart RGB PSU which adds a little bit of colour to the build without going over the top. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this PSU for higher end builds but for something on a budget well it does the job. This combination of components should make for a fine gaming experience but first let's talk a little bit more about the processor. The 10100F has 4 cores and 8 threads, it's still a plucky little fella and can be had for a very reasonable sum, especially if you don't mind buying used. It runs at reasonable temperatures even with the stock cooler and because of this there isn't too much of a racket under load. Don't let the 4 cores put you off, this still has a bit of a kick. With the Acer assembled and now working, there were a few noticeable issues, sorry, notable issues to point out. The motherboard is one of the most basic boards I've ever used and because of this there isn't quite enough USB headers to plug everything into so those extra ports at the back have become completely redundant. We've got plenty of ports on the motherboard though including the USB 3 that we lack at the front of the case. Furthermore, while it's not particularly a tight fit in here for the rest of the components, the RX 590 sits quite close to the bottom of the enclosure. I can squeeze a cheeky finger or two between the gaps so there's room for the car to breathe, just about, but increasing the airflow with some more fans wouldn't hurt. These are all factors worth considering when putting together a new build but when using an old case we have to make do with what we have sometimes. This one's on me though, the purchase of this thick boy 590 wasn't completely thought through. Nonetheless the Predator has been transformed, it's not my proudest conversion but we have power and so far so good. There's still a little bit too much RGB for my liking actually but the PSU lights can be disabled at the touch of a button. So, game time. Is AMD's best Polaris powerhouse still suitable for gaming, especially in combination with a 4-core i3? Let's find out. I still have a bit of a cold time struggling to speak here, so apologies if I'm shouting because my ears are also blocked up, or if I'm talking too quietly, but first of all we have Battlefield 1 at 1080p with the high preset, 119 FPS on average with decent 1 and 0.1% lows. You could go with Ultra if you wanted to, but I find that high gives us just as good of a visual presentation as the Ultra preset, and we get more frames this way. Cyberpunk 2077 was a very nice surprise, especially with the RX 590. 
more so the i3 to be honest four cores and eight threads still handled this even in the busier parts of town but crowd density along with everything else was turned down medium textures were enabled because we have eight gigs of vram to play with and we saw a decent average frame rate you could turn the textures down a little bit and perhaps gain a few frames here and there but Overall, it was a pretty good experience without needing to rely on FSR 2.0 either. Or is it 2.1? FSR. Just, let's just say without having to rely on FSR. CSGO at 1080p ran with over 200 frames per second with solid percentile lows as well. I tend to go with the lowest settings because these are what I call the most competitive settings. There's no point in really turning anything up because the game doesn't really look that much better at higher settings and here you want as many frames as possible. Fallout 4 is a bit of an older game but I threw this in here just to demonstrate that it can play of course older games just as well as newer ones. 90 FPS here uncapped with a 1% low of 59 and a 0.1% low of 38. You can leave the cap in place if you want to avoid certain graphical glitches and physics issues but they don't tend to occur until you sort of hit around 120 at least. Not in my experience. Call of Duty Warzone 2.0, 1080p with the balanced preset which uses a mixture of settings. It does default to a lower texture quality option but I cranked this up to high just to give everything a bit more detail. 81 FPS on average with a few little dips and drops here and there. Marvel Spider-Man Remastered again ran without the need for FSR at over 60 frames per second. The 1.1% lows were okay, you may notice a few dips and drops here and there. The CPU usage wasn't too high, it certainly wasn't bottlenecking here, and the 590 is actually the limiting factor, not only here but throughout all of the games tested today. That i3 really is still quite solid, and of course being on the Socket 1200 platform, you can upgrade it all the way to an i9 further down the line if you want to, and one of those is still going to be very good for years to come. The same can be said for the i7s. GTA 5 a bit older, but again still very popular, 1080p high settings, FXAA with the advanced graphics off. Now if you turn all of the advanced graphics on, or to their respective highest, we're still going to get about 60 FPS, but there will be a few more dips and drops here and there, and the game looks almost as good just with the highest settings, and without everything fancy turned on, 108 FPS overall. Elden Ring is capped to 60 FPS by default and I didn't change this. It actually averaged 59 which is quite annoying but the 1.1% lows were pretty good and the game looks very nice at these settings. The only things I turned off as I usually do in most games is the depth of field and motion blur options but aside from that the preset remained unchanged. Red Dead Redemption 2 at 1080p with the console quality settings hit 74 FPS. This is sort of between 1060 and 1070 NVIDIA GTX performance, and that is exactly what the R9, sorry, RX 590 was when it first came out. It was a card that sat between those two, sort of a bit of a last attempt at outdoing some of NVIDIA's options from the Polaris range from AMD. I think it was a really nice card. I didn't really see the point in it. It was a little bit expensive when it came out, but... As the price dropped, it was definitely worth considering, and now on the used market, if you can find one, and it's cheaper than a 580, definitely worth thinking about in 2022, because at 1080p, it's going to hit 60 FPS in pretty much everything you throw at it, if you manage your expectations, of course. Fortnite 1080p medium preset, more demanding than you think, but 117 FPS with... Okay, 1.1% lows, but as usual, there was the normal amount of stutter here and there, at least until we had played for an hour or so, and things started to smooth out. Overall, then, the i3-10100F and RX 590, well, a pretty good combination even in 2022, and when paired with 16 gigs of DDR4. The i3, as always, has surprised me today, and the RX 590, I don't think I've tested it since I originally reviewed it a few years ago, and I'm glad to see the price has come down and that it is still very capable. It boosts to a higher speed than most 580s as well, if not all. So yeah, pretty solid card these days. As for this video, well, I hope you've enjoyed it. Let me know what you think of the build down below. If you did like this video, of course, leave a like on it. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.